Cass Cohen. I'm Senior Vice President of Research and Development for the Organ Corporation. Some of you may uh, remember me from uh, the metal days. And yes, I, have, I do have an advanced degree in ceramics as well. So for today, we're talking about zirconia. In particular, we're talking about zirconia fracture, fracturing prevention. Now, whether your uh, present remake factor is 5%, 15%, or 30%, this lecture is designed to give you tools to go back and reduce that number. So we're interested in improving your productivity. So we're gonna talk about what is zirconia, where it comes from, how the dental grade of zirconia is made, how organ processes zirconia, and the features of zirconia. Some uh, features are very, very good and others may cause us some trouble. And again, a review of lab reported failures, and uh, we'll talk about preventing failures in your laboratory as well as in the operatory. Uh, but first, we're gonna have a uh, musical interlude. Okay, that was exciting. Now, um, I know you have two questions on your mind. Number one, yes, I did take my medication this morning. And uh, number two, what does this have to do with zirconia fracturing? Well, I want you to think about it. Think about what you just witnessed. And as I talk, uh, see if you could put it together. And then at the end, if I remember, uh, you could ask me, what was that about? <laughs> OK. So first, what is zirconia? Well. Zirconia is made from the mineral zircon. And zircon is a very special mineral. It was one of the first minerals formed three to four billion years ago. This is when the solar system was first created and the Earth was still a, uh, a, a rock. What was, uh, uh, what was happening in the, the deep beneath the Earth's mantle, zirconium silicate was being formed. It's a mix of zirconia, oxygen, and silicon. And also it has radioactive elements in there. So you know, once you, once you hear that, you know it was, it was very deep in the, in the Earth's mantle. But yet today, we find zirconia very close to the surface. And in fact, we find zircon so very, uh, on, the, on some beaches. So how does something with radioactive elements that was formed billions of years ago in, in deep in the Earth's mantle come to the surface? Well, this is a computer simulation of exactly what was going on at that time. The Earth was being bombarded with asteroids, some of them the size of Texas. And what you're seeing here is when the asteroid hit, the portion of the Earth's surface that turned to plastic and actually melted away and pushed material that was, on the, was, at, uh, was below the mantle up to the top. And it's a, it's a very dynamic uh, sequence, and this is exactly what we find. The zircon crystals themselves are extremely important for geological purposes. So, zirconia is a ceramic made from the mineral zircon. And as I said, zircon was one of the first minerals to form. It formed about two billion years before diamonds. It's a combination of zirconium and silicate with the radioactive elements. The most a, a economical mine is in Australia. And here it is here. This is uh, Jacks Hills, Australia. Here's the mine. You can see it's fairly close to the surface, and uh, it's easily mined, no problem. You take the overburden out and screen out the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the top sand, and you're left with very nice zircon uh, uh, sand. The material itself is, as I said, just a mix of zircon and silica, primarily. Very little uh, trace elements, but here we have our uh, the radioactive materials. And the important thing here is that we have thoria and uranium. And these obviously have to get reduced substantially from these, from these fairly high values. Now, how to do that? This is the difficulty. There's an alkaline process and an acid process. Right now, the majority of the materials that's made for dental zirconia uses an acid process. So it, the material gets dissolved in hydrochloric acid and water. It's a hydrothermal process, and that means nothing other than it, it's in water. It's a water-based solution, and, and then we apply temperature to it. So the zirconia 
gets, uh, for, forms a chloride. This is uh, uh, zirconium oxychloride. And it's a commodity, and you, you could go online and find out what the price is for, for any given day. And the material here is what determines the material that you wind up with. The features of the material, the strength of the material, the translucency of the material, all of it is determined in this process. So everyone buys the zirconium oxychlorate. What they do with that, determines how well the material behaves in your laboratory. You, hear, you can see here, we have a zirconia grain, and these grains are obviously larger than these grains. So you could take this liquid solution and actually mill it, and you mill down the, the crystallites. And these are very small crystallites to begin with, but you can still make them even smaller. You have a, here a colloidal material. So here you have a, a solution, like you used to mix up the investment or, or your, or your uh, or your uh, 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 model material in, in, with water. And this is what you're dealing with here. So it's, a, it's just a water-based material with solids suspended inside of it. You could take that, add yttria to it. Here we're showing what we happen to do. We add yttria chloride. So when it precipitates, it forms the, the uh, uh, yttria-stabilized zirconia immediately. You, you don't have to do it that way. You could take the yttria and add it as an oxide later. Uh, we don't find that to be as efficient. But now you have a colloidal solution, and you could actually cast the disk. And some companies do that. They, they cast the disk immediately. Or you could add an acrylic to the material, and then you have these beautiful little particles, and you do something called a spray drying process. You take the material, and that, all that means is that you pass it, you pass it through a very high, uh, uh, high volume, hot air. The water evaporates, and you're left with the acrylic-bounded uh, acrylic uh, zirconia. And this is an extremely efficient process for pressing. And that's what we happen to do. We hydraulically press it, and then we isostatically press it. The hydraulic press forms the shape, and the isostatic press makes sure the disc is uniform in density from one side to the other and top to bottom. So you have a variety of different ways of handling the product at this stage, and this is what makes everything distinctive. So that's why even though the material may seem the same on the outside, especially when you read the MSDS sheet, the material can actually behave very differently in your laboratory. As a way of illustrating that, we made units out of the coarse grain material and the fine grain material. And here they are here. So this is the same composition, exactly the same, but processed a little differently. Here we have the fine grain material and the coarse grain material. And you can see from the radiograph that the fine grain material is more opacous than the coarse grain material. That's because there's more grain boundaries, and the more grain boundaries refract the light. So it looks opacous. When you look at the units themselves in, in regular light, they, it looks a little opacous. It actually looks like it's underfired, but it's not underfired. It's actually very mature. It just doesn't have the translucency it's supposed to. So here you have the same composition, exactly the same solution, except one solution was processed a little more to make a finer grain, and you get very different results. So the properties of the zirconia that you wind up with are determined by how much yttria is added. The yttria determines the translucency of the material and in some, some degree the strength. The, uh, how the yttria is added, as I showed you, you could add it in the chloride in the liquid solution, or you could add it as an oxide afterwards in the powder. When the yttria is added, the particle size of the zirconia itself and the process used to make the powder. How the discs are fabricated, now, nowadays it's not, so, it's not so critical. It used to be critical when you just had the white material, but as a pre-shaded material, the, how the discs are fabricated is not as important, whether it's a colloidal process or a pressing process. Uh, sometimes you'll see a difference with regard to the pressing because you'll see uh, the, the, the shrinkage factor it may, may vary. For example, in, in our case, we measure every disc. Uh, some other companies don't do that. Some other companies uh, measure it by the lot, 
and then assign that number to the whole to the whole disk, uh, to the whole to the whole slot of uh, of zirconia, and um, that that works out for the most part. But sometimes, if you have a sensitive cases, especially on a on a long span bridge, you, you may find that the fit is a little off. So we don't do that. Now, the composition of dental of dental zirconia is actually very very simple. Uh, it has a mix of of uh, uh, yttria a little bit of hafnia and then alumina along with the zirconia. Now this hafnia thing, this is a mineral that goes along with zirconia and sometimes nature doesn't allow us to remove 100% uh, of, a, of a tramp element. It just stays there. But it's very, it's, it's not, uh, it's, it doesn't impact any of the properties. It's an inert, it's a, we call it a benign sister material. Uh, uh, sister material because the structure is almost identical to the zirconia and it replaces the zirconia on the, on the, on the crystal structure and uh, it doesn't affect anything like biocompatibility or translucency. Uh, the yttria can be added in 5 or 10 weight percent, 5 to 10 weight percent, and, and we're going to talk more about that later with regard to ha how that relates to uh, the, the different types of zirconia that are on, that are on the market. And then the alumina content. Now, alumina originally was added to prevent something called aging. And um, uh, zirconia has a very bad habit of absorbing water if it doesn't have any alumina in it. And what happens when it absorbs water, the water goes into grain boundaries. And this is a crystalline ceramic. And I'll, I'll show you some of the photomicrographs of it. It's a crystalline ceramic. So the water goes into grain boundaries and actually literally fractures the material apart. The grains just fall apart. So you could have a solid material in your hand at one minute, and then after the aging process takes place, it's sand. It's just particles. So they realized this happened uh, in a number of uh, cases back in the 80s. So they added alumina. And the original material added a quarter percent alumina. And you may remember the original zircon material or the lava material, where, you, where the, that was the material that you baked porcelain on top of or you pressed porcelain on top of. That was very, very white. And this is the reason why it was very, very white, because of the high alumina content. Now, over the years since then, we've learned that in order to make monolithic zirconia, we had to reduce that alumina content substantially. And in some cases, some companies just took it out, which is not a very good idea. So um, uh, where, where we are now, and the majority of our materials have about 0.05% alumina, which is enough to prevent this aging process, but yet still is uh, a sufficient amount to, uh, it still doesn't interfere with the translucency of the material. Now zirconia has a number of applications, and everyone in this room has another zirconia product that they're using, and that's in your car. It's an oxygen sensor. And zirconia has a very unique property that it conducts electricity at high temperatures. So it has to get above about 1,000 degrees C. And then what they do is they make these little tubes. And it is a fairly small tube. And on the inside, they plate it with platinum. And on the outside, they plate it with platinum. And you have this tube just sitting out in the air. And the inside, you have the exhaust gas go in. So it's measuring, it's sensitive to the difference in oxygen content between the air, which is assumed to be about 20% oxygen, and the amount of oxygen in your exhaust gas, which is obviously going to be much lower than 20%. So by measuring the current that goes through between the this, between this sides, and it's a static thing, uh, you can know exactly how much oxygen you have in your exhaust gas. And that goes back to the car computer and adjusts the air to uh, fuel ratio. And it's instantaneous. So it works very well, very, very fast. Another uh, application for zirconia uh, was in the electronics industry for what are called ferrules. And these are just little cylinders of zirconia. Now here we have two fiber optic cables. Now you know, you see these guys down digging up your street and they're putting in this fiber optic cable for your cable company. And that fiber optic cable actually has a fixed length. So when you come to the end, you have to join with another fiber optic cable. And because fiber optics are dealing with light, that join has to be perfect. They have to, two surfaces have to be perfectly parallel. And how are you going to ensure that the cable comes across and 
exactly the same, exactly the same dimension. Well, zirconia has a very unique property, and we make use of this property as well. It's totally isotropic when it gets sintered. So during the sintering operation, zirconia is operating differently than any other material we've used. Most materials, like metals or alumina or, or, or dental porcelain, would shrink on its own center of mass. So if you have a three-unit bridge and you just allow it to, uh, to uh, center by itself in like alumina, it'll turn into a little bit of a pretzel. Zirconia doesn't behave that way. Zirconia is isotropic. So no matter what the mass is or the variation of the mass, and, and in our case, the variation of the mass is depending on how many pontics you have versus how many abutments. And as you know, you can't predict that. That's depending on the case. So it'll shrink independent of where its center of mass is. And that's what they're taking advantage here. They're taking advantage of that process here because they want a cylinder that's perfectly straight. And in order to get a cylinder that's perfectly straight, the material has to be totally isotropic when they center it. And these ferrules, they made by the tens of millions uh, in, in the 80s. And they're still making them. Now, here we have uh, the application, of one of the biomedical applications that you may remember, and that is a zirconia uh, ceramic head in a hip joint. And this was very successful for decades. And then one day, they got a report that it cracked. And the next day, they got a report that six cracked. And the next day, they got a report that 27 cracked. Altogether, hundreds of these things cracked. So the first thing they thought of, well, maybe it's a contamination problem. Well, it wasn't a contamination problem. Maybe there's something wrong with the composition. No, nope, nothing wrong with the composition. They failed because what they wanted to do was to improve the speed of sintering and they changed the sintering process. They tried to go a little faster. And going a little faster weakened the material substantially internally, and they failed. That's the only reason. It was only a couple of batches of material from saint Gobain in France. But yet, because of that, the entire industry went away. No one wanted to touch it anymore, especially when the insurance companies got a hold of it. So can you believe that? They actually wanted to center zirconia faster. I mean, we would never do that, right? <laughs> now, you see the advertisements, 510K cleared, ISO compatible, whatever. And I want to share with you what the ISO standard is. The ISO standard 6872, the most recent revision is 2015, is actually the standard that was used for porcelain. And they have not updated it for zirconia. But yet, that's what is presented. So what does that mean? Well, because it was designed for porcelain, there's no compositional requirements. You remember the old days with the alloys. You know, you had a high noble, noble, predominantly base. High noble have to have at least 40% gold in it. You restricted the composition. Here, there's no restriction on the composition. Nothing. Zero has limited mechanical property requirements because the mechanical properties were designed for aluminous porcelain. How many people here remember aluminous porcelain? I mean, I hardly remember aluminous porcelain. <laughs> and I'm old. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so so it, was, it was designed for a product that we don't use anymore. And the properties, the mechanical properties, are, are really insufficient for the type of designs we're making. When you think about all on four or all on sixes, you can't use a material that has a, a strength of only 800 megapascals. That's absurd. It'll break. It might even break before it gets to the patient. And it has a radioactivity test for uranium, but not thorium. Now, the reason why the uranium is in there, because in the beginning of, of in, the, in the 60s, when they first started developing dental porcelain, they used uranium dioxide as a fluorescing agent. And it's a very efficient fluorescing agent. But then the FDA came in and said, uh, we don't want you to do that. We don't want you to put uranium in people's mouths. So it was replaced with Syria. But yet, I just showed you that the zircon material is loaded with not only uranium, but also thorium. They don't talk about thorium. Not cool. And the solubility test is made for a glass 
which in most cases dissolves much better than a, than a, than a ceramic, crystalline ceramic. So that means it'll always pass. So we're dealing with a situation where you have to rely upon the company in order to give you a good product. Because you can't rely upon the standards committee and you can't rely upon the FDA. Because this, this standard is very poor. Now the ADA came out with their own standard and it's even worse. <laughs> it's, it's, it's terrible. I, I don't understand where these people are coming from. Anyway, so processing zirconia in the laboratory. Now you know you put the you put the disc in the mill and you and you mill it. Now every mill monitors the burr usage. And it's very important that you pay attention to that. When that little pop-up comes up and saying replace 2.0 millimeter burr end mill, please do that. The zirconia is second in hardness only to diamond. It's much harder than the carbide tools that you're using to mill it. So as you're, as you're milling out the zirconia, you're really destroying the end mill. And the sharper the end mill, the better is going to be your contours and the better is going to be your surface and the less chipping you're going to have. If you allow the mill to go past its useful life, you're going to start getting chipping and you're going to get an insidious type of chipping where the, where the material will actually fracture, but you won't know it until after it's sintering. So that's like 10 hours wasted. And then you carefully remove the materials from the disc. When you do that, make sure you support the units underneath. Don't let them drop on the, on the table. The zirconia, when it's sintered, is extremely strong. The zirconia, when it's in the pre-sintered state, is not. So you have to have some care taken with these discs. When you center it in the furnace, use a lid on the tray. Because the molybdenum disilicide heating element that you have in your furnace actually produces a, a metallic gas. And that metallic gas will actually condense on your units. That's like a yellow stain. In some cases, it can even be a, a, a white spot. Also, because of this problem of the, of the um, molybdenum disilicide, you, could, you need to decontaminate your furnaces, just like you used to do when you had a silver bearing alloy. And the, how, how often you do it depends upon how much work you do. We do it once a week because we do thousands a day. If you're not doing that much, except for Glidewell over there, uh, they're, uh, <laughs> they're, uh, they're, uh, you, know, you, do, you do it a little less, maybe once a month, once every two weeks. Use a lid on the tray, and, and when you glaze it, never use a glaze over 900 degrees C. 900 degrees C is very sensitive for zirconia. It'll actually crack. So you want to use a glaze in 700 or 800 degree territory. Now here I'm showing a rolling mill, but you know all of the uh, mills have some type of uh, a steel ring around it that supports the disc. Now notice that there's dirt, or that there's uh, excess zirconia powder on the support. Clean that off before you put the next disc in. And the reason why you want to do that is when you put the disc on this, on this extra zirconia powder, it's no longer even. And in that area where the powder is, it actually may form a little crack when you go and press down on it. You need that to be totally clean. You need that to be even. Now, when you remove the units from the disc, most of the people use a high-speed handpiece, and that's fine. But a high-speed handpiece, remember, creates a tremendous amount of vibration. So when you do use the burr against the portion of the support that's in the zirconia disc itself, not next to the unit, don't try and save time by cutting that, by cutting that support close to the unit because that'll increase the amount of vibration and you may get an internal crack. Now, some other uh, mills use this type of a uh, support mechanism and it's a, it's a metal, it's a, it's, it's a metal uh, ring and you tighten down the, the bolts. Now, how many people ever changed a flat tire on their car? Yeah. Okay, so you know that when you put the new tire back on, hopefully you're having a tire, when you put the new tire back on, you don't tighten the lugs 100%.
you do like a star pattern. You go from top, bottom, across, bottom, side, the side. You lower the car off the jack, and then you repeat that. Do the same thing with your zirconia disc if you have this type of a support. Because again, you can't, you're not going to do the, you're, you're, you're going to generate a significant amount of stress if you torque down one side rather than the other more than, at first. So you're, tight, you're tightening this one, and this one is still loose, so it's going to come up, and it's not going to be even anymore. And these type of uh, supports are the most destructive with, with regard to zirconia. The, the, most of the mills were made for the ultra material, the high strength materials, so their speed rates are very fast, and the, uh, and, and the expectation on the, on the zirconia is, is, on a, is going to be very high. And as we get to new zirconias and new different compositions, the material is a little more friable. Good. Uh, zirconia is very inert, and that's good for the patient because that means it's, it's going to be totally biocompatible. The biocompatibility results are, of zirconia are unparalleled. It's better than alumina. It's fantastic. There's no chance of any adverse tissue reaction, Zippo. If you have a dentist that says uh, the, a patient has, has a reaction, has a little uh, red around, around the margin, it's probably due to the cement that he used, not, not the zirconia. So it's very inert. That's a good thing, or it's a bad thing, because it can't be etched. The cracks cannot be healed. Any chips cannot be repaired. I've seen people put, try and put some porcelain on, the, on a little chip on a margin and, and send it out. That's not cool. Um, it has very poor adherence with porcelain. The uh, uh, original porcelains had, actually the majority of them on the zirconia base were actually held together by mechanical stress. So it had to be entirely over it. When you do uh, uh, micro layering, you do a cutback and a micro layering, make sure that none of that micro layering is actually goes into function. Just keep it on the facial, make it look pretty, but don't make it, don't, don't, don't allow it to go into function or else it'll chip off. And there's bonding, bonding is questionable. I know uh, Bisco has some uh, uh, nice products on the market and they're saying that they, they have, a, they, they did form a bond with the phosphorus, but it's, it's not, uh, it's not 100% yet. The crack will never heal. Full stop. <laughs> you can't do that. It's not like, like porcelain. We're going to talk more about that, too. OK. Uh, zirconia doesn't conduct heat. And that's fantastic for the patient, because there's not going to be any hot, cold sensitivity, even on, a, even on a root canal. It doesn't matter. The zirconia will not conduct heat at all. And that's a good thing for the patient. But it's not so good for us, because there's no indication that it's overheating when you're contouring it. Remember when you had that three unit bridge and, and, you, and you, were, you, you were grinding in the, the anatomy, you felt it get warm, you put it in the, in the little water bottle, the water container you had next to the grinding unit, right? You can't do that with this. It, it just doesn't work. You, you're not gonna get in any indication. Any minor contouring and, and adjustments must be made with water. You can't do anything dry. And you can't use any hard tools on the centered product. On center zirconia, you cannot use any carbides and you cannot use any diamond disc. Everyone loves to use diamond disc because it's so easy to open up the embrasures. And with zirconia, you open up more than the embrasures, I'll show you. Okay. Any type of hard tools will concentrate the heat and it'll force the zirconia to transform. And we're gonna talk more about that. And, and you'll get a total fracture, like here. Um, our friends at Glidewell show this on their, on their technical update. When you use a diamond disc, it leaves a specific mark that you can look at under high magnification. Yeah. So uh, people say to me, well, you know, Paul, you, know, you, you did these units for me, and, and, and they cracked. And I said, did you use a diamond disc? Oh, no, no, no. I said, can you send it back to me? Sure. I get it back. I look here, and look at that. You could tell exactly that a diamond disc was used. The very telltale. And uh, I'll explain to you in a minute why this happens, but the crack goes right through. It's, a, it's an immediate fracture. Uh, 
There are there are tools now that are that are produced by like Bruxer, uh, by uh, Brassler or or uh, I forget the name of the card, Dedico or whatever. Uh, that they're they're diamond they're diamond discs, but they're not hard diamond discs. They're not metal backed diamond disc. It's it's a it's a rubberized material, or there's even there's even a paper disc. You need diamonds in order to, to, to hit the zirconia, so that once it's sintered. However, you, you don't want the metal portion there because it's the metal portion that's going to that's going to uh, uh, um, uh, not allow the heat to dissipate. Well, so it's happening with the heat, you say. I'm sorry. It's because you're talking about the happening with the heat. Yes. The problem with the heat. Yeah, yeah. But it's the the diamond. The, the hard tools generate heat. Oh. Okay. When they hit the zirconia. Okay, so we're going to talk about that right now. So uh, grinding metal is not the same as grinding cinder zirconia. And when we ground metal, we push the tool into the material, <laughs> and we got a little, uh, a, a little bit coming off. But look at the temperature profile. The temperature profile is very high where the tool impacted the, the, the part. But because the metal is able to conduct heat, the metal is dissipating the heat away from the, from, from the tool portion. You could feel that get warm, but it's dissipating the energy. So it's, it's actually trying to heal itself. Okay? That doesn't happen with zirconia. Zirconia doesn't conduct heat. So you need diamond in order to score it. But what happens when you score it, you actually form these little radial cracks under the surface. And it's these ra little chips of material that form from the radial cracks that's coming off. So you're really not there carving the metal. You're not carving the zirconia. You're contouring the zirconia. You're more like Michelangelo hitting a piece of marble and all the chips are coming off. That's exactly what's happening here. All the chips are coming off. And if you allow for the, uh, too much heat to be generated, even with, even with the proper tools, what will happen is it will form a median crack, and that median crack goes right through the unit. And that's what we saw on that bridge where, where it went right through. And, and, and the yttria-based, uh, yttria-stabilized zirconia has, uh, ha has a very little tolerance for any type of these median cracks. It'll, it'll, it'll fracture almost immediately. And here we have, here we have another example. Same deal. Uh, this was a little more difficult to show because the, 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 the people used a, uh, to determine rather, because the people used a, the uh, uh, Emax uh, glaze, so it was a little thicker. So I didn't have that indication of where the, uh, where the uh, diamond disc was used. But when we examined the surface, we could tell exactly that diamond disc was used. And I could also tell that the technician was left-handed. OK. So, <laughs> so, so uh, after you do this a while, you get to, you get to know everything. OK, so uh, again, zirconia doesn't conduct heat. So what does that mean? That means it's going to be very sensitive to geometry. If you have a thick section next to a thin section, you have to cool those units very, very slowly. And when do we have a thick section with a thin section? Next, when we have a bridge. You have an abutment with a thin wall next to a, next to a pontic with a very heavy wall. So that's why when you look at anybody's instructions for bridge work, the bridge work cycles for sintering are so long, especially the cooling cycle. You really have to take time on cooling these things because if you don't, if you try and take them out of the oven too fast, you want to get that get unit to the doctor. You, I understand that. But if you do it too fast, you're going to crack it. You waste it a whole day. And where else does this occur? Well, when you try and do bridge work, supporting the units with bridge work. If you use the wrong support size, what will happen? It will actually crack right at the support where, where, you're, where, you're, trying to, where you're trying to do the best to, to, keep, it, to keep it stable. And when you do do bridges with an arch, you need these type of supports. And there are different designs that people use, but the point of the matter is you, 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 need, to, you need to address it. Now, people ask me, how many units can you put in a furnace? Well, that depends on the furnace. But there's a simple rule of thumb, two rules of thumb that you could use, and that, that'll, that'll give you exactly what you need. Don't allow any zirconia units to touch another. Now, I'm sure all of you, this is exactly what it looks like in your lab. I know. I'm sure. So none of the units touch each other, and none of the units touch the, touch the wall. If any of the units touch each other, or if any of the units touch the wall, you're going to wind up with white spots, because the material just cannot conduct heat. Yes? Uh, so why, why does that happen when you have them sitting on the floor of the tray? Uh, what's the difference? 
Now, uh, if you're if you're talking about the newer trays, right? Okay, the newer trays conduct heat, and that's the secret of the tray. So it's trying to compensate for the zirconia not being able to conduct heat. Okay, so the newer trays, as you know, are fairly expensive. And the reason why they're expensive is because they're, they have a conductive material inside of it. So th th these are just regular um, uh, 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 zirconia or alumina trays, and th that's what you don't want to touch. Th the other trays, where, where, where they don't use the beads, yeah, th those, are, those are conductive. So it's, it's trying to address it from a different way. So right. one accidentally hits the wall. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's okay for, the, for, that, tra for that tray only. <laughs> for that tray only. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are a couple of companies that have this new uh, uh, system out where you don't use any beads, and it's a special tray. You can't take a regular tray, remove the beads, and expect the units to center properly. It's not going to happen. With these new trays, though, the new trays are actually conductive. So it compensates for, for, the, uh, for the zirconia. And the zirconia actually slides over it because, it, it, because the materials are, are hot. What's the company's name? I'm sorry? The new trade, the company's name? There are two. We don't, I, I don't want to do that, I, if you don't mind. <laughs> Uh, well, not percentage-wise. It, it varies in the last uh, last digit of this of this of the shrinkage factor. Yeah, you'll see there. But as long as you type the shrinkage factor in, you're fine. And in most cases, even in the, the uh, that's another thing about the ADA standard. The ADA standard only looks at three digits on the shrinkage factor. And I guess if you're making three unit bridges, that's okay. But if you're making a roundhouse, you're doing a law of four. You need that fourth digit. So. So that's why we do it, because I mean, the majority of cases are not going to make any difference, but I never know when you're going to get it. <laughs> yes. Well, you mentioned before that, um, that you would replace a lid on that tray. Yeah. yeah. Um, there, there are some furnaces that don't allow you to put a lid on, I know, but those furnaces generally are silicon carbide, not molybdenum disilicide. And it's the molybdenum disilicide that generates that gas at high temperature. Okay, and we're going to talk more about that. Okay. Regarding the beads, how much beads should you put? You need at least one layer clean, because the, the, on, on a regular tray, the, the zirconia is going to, as I said, is going to sinter, sinter uh, isotropically, so it can't have any drag. So you want it, You want to make sure that the, that the beads actually uh, allow the material to move. So you need at least one layer, one clean layer. Well, it depends on how much you put in there. Uh, you'll see the beads change color. And, and one, one neat trick is to have a, a clean, set, a, a little tray of clean beads next to the furnace when you take your units out. So you can immediately see the color difference. And, and when, it, when it gets too dark, you just, you just change them out. Now, unfortunately, if you wait too long, sometimes the uh, shade will be off or you'll get a yellow stain on, on your units that you can't get out. Okay, so uh, zirconia can be made to look like that of porcelain on the outside. It, 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 it's, it's white, and, and you can make nice little, nice little uh, uh, geometries. But on the inside, it's very different. On the inside, it's a crystalline ceramic with a very fine grain structure, about 10 times less than that of the metals, but it's still a crystalline ceramic. Uh, dental porcelain is a glass. There's no structure to it at all. These little things you see floating around, those are the lucite crystals that determine the thermal expansion of the, of the glass. So there's no structure in a, in, a, in a dental porcelain and a specific structure in zirconia. And that makes a world of difference because of the, the grain boundaries. Each surface, of the, when, the, when the grain boundaries are on the surface, each one of these grain boundaries becomes a defect. Ceramics have intrinsic defects. It's not a matter of when they're going to break, of how they're going to break. It's a matter of when they're going to break. What conditions? 
Unlike glass, right, not glass. So what you, you asked the question before, can you reheal it? With dental porcelain, you could reheal it because the glass is gonna flow. There's nothing that flows with, with zirconia. So it looks like white, it looks like it's porcelain, but it's not. It, it's white, that's about it. So the troublesome features of a crystalline ceramic is that there's no tolerance for tensile forces. It, it, it'll readily fracture, it has no elasticity whatsoever. Anytime it flexes, it'll crack. When does it flex? When, when is that an important property? When the dentist is inserting the unit. Some of them have a very large thumb and they press down. And when they press down on a PFM or a full cast gold, that's okay. Because the, the metal will actually expand and then contract again. The zirconia will not. It'll just fracture. It's very sensitive to surface force, as I said, and again, it cannot be healed. Now here's a case where um, we, have, we have two problems here. Uh, the, the dentist made a mistake when he, when he, uh, when he did the insertion. He, he put it at an angle, expecting it to flex, and of course it doesn't. And the, the design was poor because the mid-facial wall thickness was the same thickness as the margin at two tenths. And that's not cool. Now every material has its own properties with regard to how it's going to, how it's going to behave. If you have a metal material that happens to be tolerant, it's a ductile material, it's tolerant of both tensile and compressive forces, well, that's okay because it doesn't make any difference. You could do a lot more with the design than you have with a material like zirconia or, or dental porcelain where it has no tolerance, or alumina, has no tolerance for tensile forces. So when do you get tensile forces? Well, on, this, on a bridge, for example, uh, the intaglia surface of the connector, when the bridge goes into function, will go into tension. And that's when it, that's what it'll crack. For those of you that uh, had done Procera before, you may remember that's exactly where those Procera bridges cracked, right at the intaglia sur 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 uh, surface first. And that's the reason why. Now, fortunately, in the mouth, the majority of forces that we experience are all compressive. And that's why we're able to use composites. That's why we're able to use dental porcelain. That's why we're able to use zirconia. Because all these, all these materials are fine in compression. And in most cases, that's the only type of force that we're, that we're looking at, except for bridge work in the connector area. So our friends at Glywell came up with this handy dandy uh, calculation for the size of a bridge connector. And the calculation is a little different than, than what you used, used to have for metals. The metals used to just take the, take the area of the connector and, and uh, see if it was like 9 or 12, depending on where it was in the mouth. But for a zirconia, the recommendation is to take the height of the connector, which is very, very important. The higher the height, the stronger the connector. And instead of taking the width of the connector, you take the width of the, of the length of the connector between the units. That's very important. So you take those numbers, you multiply them out, and you get a number of 27 or more, and you're okay. No matter where the design is in the mouth, the 27 or more is fine for a regular um, uh, high strength, uh, high translucent material. Now we know that the biting force changes depending upon where it is in the mouth. If it's in the uh, anterior portion, we're only dealing with like 90 newtons. We only have to do 90 newtons in order to shear our meat. But for the molars, we're up to 400, and in some cases, almost 500 newtons in a, in a large person. And that's because the, mortar, the, the, um, the molar has to act as a mortar and pestle, has to grind the food. So the force is greatest over here. Uh, your dog has about a couple more times this. Uh, an African crocodile is 12,000 newtons. So when you see the, the, uh, the YouTube videos of the crocodile coming out of the water, grabbing the wildebeest and pulling them into water, you think that the wildebeest has a chance of getting away? No way. That, that's called lunch. <laughs> the Jaws of an African crocodile are very similar in structure to a Tyrannosaurus rex. And if you do the calculations, the force of the biting force of a Tyrannosaurus rex, 35,000 newtons. When, when it bit into a triceratops, the bones of the triceratops actually exploded in the animal's mouth. 
unbelievable. Totally useless information. But anyway, <laughs> so, so, uh, so, okay, so we know that we, this, this molar has to tolerate a tolerate of a biting force of 400 newtons. So how thick does a unit have to be? It's a very simple calculation. You take the strength of the zirconia at 1,100 megapascals. You look at how much st stress you have, to, you have to tolerate. And bingo is a nice little line. And it says 6 tenths of a millimeter. So that occlusal thickness on that molar has to be 6 tenths of a millimeter. How often do you get that much clearance? Maybe once in a blue moon. Right? Dentists don't like to take that away. But that's what you need. So what I'm saying is that the preparation design makes a big difference as to how many units you're going to get back from your dentist fractured. And that's the first thing you should look at. Now, we have a couple of conditions out there that are saying the anterior type porcelains, uh, zirconias rather, are, 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 are fracturing at a higher rate. And they're right. It is. And the strength of those materials is lower, 650, 850, whatever. But that just means that the occlusal thickness has to be greater. And you look at the preparation guides. You know what preparation guides are. Those are what dentists use as bookmarks. Right? You, you look at the preparation guides, and you see for a high translucent material with 11,000 megapascals, 1,100 megapascals, the minimum thickness is 6 tenths. For a uh, uh, super translucent, it's eight cents. And it doesn't make any difference who you look at, whether it's Glidewell, whether it's Argon, whether it's Ivoclar, whether it's Dent Supply, it's the same case. So they're right. Those clinicians are right. This type of these super translucent zirconias are cracking more often than the, than the high translucent are. However, the reason is that dentists are not paying attention to the preparation design like they're supposed to like the instructions say. That's the reason why. So here we have a case where the occlusal thickness is only 3 tenths of a millimeter. Now, I used to call these things little baseball caps when they did PFMs, but you can't even make a PFM like that. 3 tenths of a millimeter. And, and of course, it, it cracks. It needs to be 6 tenths in order to survive in a, in, in a molar area. And here you have one where uh, the occlusal thickness is under 5 tenths. And again, it cracks very nicely. Because it needs 6 tenths in order to survive 400, new uh, 400 uh, newtons of force. Now in this case, this happens to be a fairly large unit, so maybe that person actually has more than 400 newtons. But either way, the preparation was insufficient. Um, now, wh why, why do you think dentists give you these preps. Why do you think these people think that this material is indestructible? <laughs> I don't think so. Because look at what's happening here. You have a hard material, zircon. It's a centered zircon, zirconia unit. The only thing that's harder than this is a, is a diamond. And it's being pressed into a soft material wood. When was the last time you did that? When you had a hammer and nail. You took the nail, you put it against the wood, you took the hammer, you hit it on the nail. The nail never broke. The nail may have bent a little because you hit it at the wrong angle. But the nail never broke. It can't. It's harder than the wood. Here, the zirconia is actually harder than the hammer. So why would it break? I mean, it's a nice marketing program, but technically it's invalid. But they bought it. And now we're stuck with dentists that think that this material is, is, is indestructible. And it's not. They have to pay attention to the prep guide. They have to pay attention to, to preparation design. Mullers, I suspect, are particularly susceptible to fracture because you have the occlusal fossa. And I know everyone wants to make a nice, sharp occlusal fossa. But if you do that, you do it in the pre-centered state, 
And when you center it, you're going to find that the occlusal fossa are always round because nature hates a sharp angle. Nature will always try and make some type of a sphere in order to round it out, in order to make everything uniform. Keep it like that. Don't try and make it any better. This is perfect. And this is the thickness that has to be 6 tenths, by the way, not this. Now, is this new? No, it's not new. How do you compare materials? It's very difficult to compare a material like a metal, which is good in tension and compression, with a, with a, with a material like a ceramic that's only good in compression. We actually have two different systems. One, Weeble modulus and, and flexural strength, and the other, ultimate tensile strength, elastic modulus. Sounds the same, but they're different, very different. They're tested in very different conditions. There's only one property that you, that you could use to compare them, and that's something called a fracture toughness. And this is the propensity of the material to fracture. And when you look at zirconia, well, 9.5 for high translucent. That's a good number. Look at, look at regular feldspathic porcelain, 1.4. Emax, 2.5. The super translucent, 5. These are good numbers. So zirconia is very strong as a ceramic. As a ceramic, it's very strong. But then look at the metals. This is what you put that porcelain on top of. Three times more. Four times more. If you use a non-precious, it's almost seven times more. So you can't design and process zirconia the way you used to process PFMs. People say, oh, the felspatic porcelain is so, it's so coarse. It's, it, it, it's so weak. Not when you put it on top of a metal. That's why it worked. Now, there's one metal that cannot tolerate any tensile forces at all, and that's cast iron. And this, you're looking at an engineering marvel. This was, this was a cast iron bridge, and a cast iron, it, was, it was made in England in 1796. Every element of this bridge is in compression when a person or a horse goes over it. When it's supportive, Every element is in compression. And look at the arch. Look at the way the arch is. It convex downward, right? Okay. So this material has the same problem as our zirconia. It has to be in compression. And for the most part, all of our designs are, 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 are good that way. Okay. But what happens with our units? With our units, we have, a, a, again, a three-unit bridge. And look at, look at where, the, where the arch is. Again, it's downward. Convert, it's uh, 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 convex downward. So again, it's in, okay, everything's going to be in compression, which is good, except for this little area here, right? We know that. Now, what can you do if you have a, again, look at the arches downward, right? What can you do if you have a material that is tolerant of both tensile and compressive force? Well, that cast iron bridge was 100 feet in span, 100 feet. And as a matter of fact, that cast iron bridge is still there. When I gave this presentation to our English group, one woman said, that's down the street from me. So it's still there. Anyway, this is what you can do when you have a material that's a good in tension and compression. Instead of a 100-foot span, you have 12,831 feet. This is the longest uh, suspension bridge in the world. It's in Japan. And look at, the, look at the arch. Where's the arch? Convex upward. This whole span is in tension. So you could design marvelous things with a material that is tolerant of both tensile and compressive force. But when you have a material that is only good in compression, you have to pay attention to the design. That's the only thing I'm saying here. It's the only illustration. Zirconia cannot be designed, contoured, and adjusted like PFM restorations. If you take nothing else from this, from this seminar, that's exactly what I want you to remember. When you're holding that three unit uh, zirconia bridge in your hand, I don't want you to think it's a PFM restoration. I want you to think it's a, it's a thing of beauty that needs to be treated a little differently than a PFM. And one of the ways they sold the three-shaped software was to say how fast you could do a, a unit. Look at this. They did this unit in three, mi three minutes and 37 seconds. Unbelievable. What productivity. Fantastic. I don't want you to do it in three minutes and 37 seconds. I want you to do it in 13 minutes and 37 seconds. 
because I want you to make use of the tools that they give you. When you have an anatomy library, choose the proper anatomy in that library for the unit you're working on. That will save you a tremendous amount of time and less, less contouring. You can't take that material like you used to take porcelain and grind in the anatomy. After it's centered, it doesn't behave very well, it fractures. Use the tools that are available to you. And 3Shape and, and ExoCAD also, they give you a variety of tools. Choose the proper anatomy library. Use the smart tools for contacts and occlusion. Know what your dentist's like. And keep a list next to your, next to your computer screen. And adjust the, the, the contacts and occlusion depending upon what that particular dentist is for that case. Neighboring teeth undercut tools for, 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 better, for better adjacent contacts. And always use a virtual articulator. If you use a virtual articulator and know what your dentist like, you're going to get less returns and you're going to get less complaints from your, from your clients. So that 10 minutes extra time will save you 10 hours if you have to redo just one unit. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a no-brainer. It's really a no-brainer. Okay. Well, the, the, it, it depends on the, the fossa. It depends upon the cusp. So different, different, uh, different people have different, different geometries. And, and some dentists prefer one geometry over another as well. Some people have flat teeth. Some people right. Have that's right. That's right. But, but there's a, there's a, there's a, a, instead of trying to grind it in yourself, use the libraries that are there and, and choose it. And I think you could buy extra libraries as well. It's not very expensive. The, I'm talking about the anatomy of the surface. It, regardless, I'm talking about the anatomy of the surface. I don't want you to grind in the anatomy. I want you to use the library so that it's already there. When you use the library, the STL file, the unit will actually, gr will actually mill the anatomy in that you want. Okay. Okay, okay. okay now, like Achilles, uh, 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 zirconia has a fatal flaw. And in order to demonstrate that flaw, I'm going to use an analogy. And the analogy I'm going to use is just simple water, because we're familiar with water. Uh, water has three phases, uh, a gas phase, which we call steam, a liquid phase, which we call liquid water, and a solid phase, which we call ice. Now, can you think of a time when we want to prevent water from going from one phase to another? Well. Maybe not in Southern California, but in Texas and in most of the other countries, every now and then there's something called winter. And it gets cold. It gets close to the freezing point. And when the temperature is close to the freezing point and it get a little rain trickling down, this happens. The bridge will always freeze faster than the, than the, than, than the roadway. The roadway is warmed by the, the earth underneath it. The bridge has, water, has wind going underneath it, and it's going to cool it. So here you have something called I grew up with black ice. Other people call it other names. So you can't tell as you're driving down this road, you can't tell where the, where the water is versus the ice. You go on here, step on your brake, and all of a sudden you're doing a pirouette. Okay. So what do we do to prevent this situation? Well, we add salt. We add salt to the water. And when you add salt to the water, you actually lower the melting temperature of the ice down. You're stabilizing the liquid phase. You're stabilizing a liquid phase over a longer temperature range. Okay. So that's what we're doing. We're stabilizing one phase in order to uh, prevent it from going to the other phase. Now, zirconia also has three phases. And they, we happen to call them cubic phase, tetragonal phase, and monoclinic phase. Those are fancy names for the structures. Uh, everyone knows what cubic zirconia is. Uh, substitute for diamonds. It's what guys give their betrothed when they know there's no jeweler in the family. Right? And, and then the tetragonal phase, this is the strong phase. This is the phase we want. We want to stabilize this phase. And then if there's nothing in there to stabilize it, it'll automatically go to a monoclinic phase, which is the weakest phase. And it's weak for the following reason. If you if you, uh, uh, oh, 
I'm sorry, one, one, one other thought. So I just want to compare. When you add salt to the water, you're stabilizing the liquid phase. And you can see the line here, stabilizing it. And here, when you add yttria to zirconia, again, you get that same line. See the triangle? And here is the tetragonal phase. So it's stabilizing the tetragonal phase. So the yttria and the zirconia has, in the same it has the same feature as the salt in the water, stabilizing that middle phase. Okay? Now, why do we want to stabilize the middle the, uh, the, way. Why do we want to stabilize that phase? Because when, when, you, when, when you put the water in your ice cube trays and put it in the, in, the, in the refrigerator, you fill the ice cube trays to the top. But when you took it out, the ice cubes are actually larger than the amount of water you put in there to begin with. Well, actually, they don't occupy a, a higher volume. Same number of water molecules. Same thing with zirconia. The tetragonal phase will expand when it transforms to the monoclinic phase. And this is a substantial increase. This is almost 7% by volume increase. It's even more than the water. So it'll just rip that, that material apart. It literally rips it apart. So we don't like the monoclinic phase. Now, we tolerate the monoclinic phase when we do a little bit of contouring because it's on the surface. And this adjustment can be compensated for because there's nothing against it. What we want to do is make sure it doesn't happen under the surface or throughout the unit. Okay. Now, every system will always go to its lowest, stable, most stable form, but sometimes it needs a little bit of energy to do so. So here we have dominoes, and most people play dominoes. You have a little block, and you know if you stand the domino on edge, it'll stay there forever until you give it a little tap, right? You give it a little tap, and then the whole things go. Why? That little bit of energy multiplies itself, and it's moving down so that it, the unit can actually go to a more stable form, which is flat down rather than standing up. And this is what's happening when we hit our zirconia, when we contour our zirconia. We're adding a little bit of energy, and that little bit of energy will transform the tetragonal form to the monoclinic form. And if we do it enough, it'll fracture. That's what happens when the dentist gets a hold of it. If they don't use water when they, when, they, when, they, when they adjust the contact, it'll fracture. If you see sparks, you're witnessing the marvelous transformation of zirconia from tetragonal to monoclinic because it's going to a lower energy form, and the sparks you see is a manifestation of the excess energy. Isn't that marvelous? That's fantastic. But you don't want to see sparks. You don't want your dentist to say, hey, that was a nice show I did there on, on that unit. <laughs> you don't want that. The dentists have to know to adjust, always adjust with water. Okay. Okay. So now some of you may be thinking, hey, wait a minute, Paul. You told me that the monoclinic form is, is a larger volume than the tetragonal form. So if I have a crack in my tetragonal zirconia, and it starts to extend and transforms into monoclinic. Well, that monoclinic form is going to be larger than what originally started with, and the tetragonal form. So what happens? Well, maybe it'll stop it like a cork. That's called transformation toughening. It's not the same type of fracture as we've been talking about. This is under low stress. So you have a circumstance where you have low stress, like chewing, for example, mastication. And the crack extension is not a significant percent of the part dimension. That's very critical. Okay. Now, in material science, we do things by comparison. We find a system that seems to exhibit some property that we like, and we try and find analogous systems to see if that property can be, can be uh, exploited. For example, the first superconductor material was superconductive only at minus 200 degrees. Now, you can't make the world minus 200 degrees. So they started using analogous systems. They put barium in there, and they put sodium in there in order to, in order to get the, the material to react a little differently. But everyone, everything was analogous. So, so it tried to get that same property, that superconductor property, but only at room temperature. And the bomb succeeded. But everything's done by analogy. So the first zirconia systems that were developed were magnesia zirconia. And here you see the magnesia stabilizes the tetragonal. See that little angle again? See that little triangle? And, and that's cool. 
So it's stabilizing the tetragonal. And, and then, then they looked at Syria. And you look at Syria and say, oh, look at this. This stabilizes the tetragonal too. So this is an analogous system. So what happens in the magnesium system may be the same as what happens in the Syria system. Oh, look at this. This is our yttria system. We can't use magnesia in, in dental because magnesia stabilizes zirconia uh, when it's centered, has little holes in it. And that's not good for, well, that's very good for bacterial growth, but uh, so we can't use that. So um, here you have the yttria stabilized zirconia, and again, this stabilizes the tetragonal phase. So when you look at what happened with the magnesia zirconia, you say, wow, as the crack extends, the zirconia, this is the blue line, the zirconia gets stronger. Look at this, the fracture toughness goes up. It almost doubles. It goes from 8 to almost, almost 15. That's fantastic. That's called transformation toughening. And that's what everyone wrote about. And everyone assumed that the yttria stabilized zirconia is going to be the same. Well, look at the magnesium one. Look at the Syria one. It's not as strong as the magnesium, but it's behaving the same. This also transformation toughens. Very few people actually took a look at what happened with the yttria stabilized zirconia. Because what happens with the yttria stabilized zirconia is that it just breaks. And look again at the crack extension. In order to get any strength out of magnesium zirconia, the crack extension had to be over five tenths of a millimeter, almost one millimeter. Our parts aren't that thick. Our little walls on the abutment aren't that thick. So it's going to crack right through. So that doesn't apply. And the yttria zirconia doesn't, doesn't show any type of, of, uh, of transformation toughening at all at even reasonable uh, crack extensions. Why? Because there's something called a critical crack dimension. Anything larger than this particular dimension and the material will fail catastrophically. And in the case of the zirconias that we use, that happens to be 10 to 20 microns. Very, very small. Remember what I said before? It has to be uh, a significant, uh, uh, not a significant portion of the thickness. 10 microns is not a significant portion of, of, our, of, our, of our wall thickness, but it's certainly no, nowhere near a half a millimeter. So it's just going to fail. So all the work that we've read about transformation toughening on zirconia is correct for magnesia stabilized zirconia, for Syria stabilized zirconia, but not for the materials that we happen to be using, not yttria stabilized zirconia. It just doesn't work. So we can't depend on it. So I've heard dentists say, look, I don't mind if there's a little crack because it'll heal. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't take care of itself. It'll just fracture. OK, now we're going to talk a little bit about rapid centering of zirconia. Rapid centering of zirconia has nothing to do with the brand. It has nothing to do with the composition. It has everything to do with the facilities that you have in your laboratory and how you want to use it. All you're doing is, when you're centering material, you're taking something that's 50% dense and making it 100% dense. So what does that mean? There's 50% air that has to get out of there. And in the case of zirconia, it could only get out through the grain boundaries. Remember, this is a crystalline material. So the only way that the little air molecule is going to get out of there is through the grain boundaries. So those grain boundaries have to be active, and they have to remain active in order to get all the air out of it. You have to have a small number of units in the furnace. No bridges. You can't tolerate any bridges, because any fast cycle on bridges is going to crack it. it. Has to have a small furnace. The furnace, the thermal mass of the furnace has to be small because that, that furnace itself, the inside of the furnace, has to also get to that same temperature as the zirconia. So the larger that, that, that furnace is, the, the physical heating element, the larger that is, the longer it's going to take to heat up and the longer it's going to take to cool down. And you have to use silicon carbide, not molybdenum disilicide. The molybdenum disilicide, these are the higher temperature ones, the one that say to go 1600, 1700. Those are good for heating to those temperatures. However, they're not good on co rapid cooling. The, 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 elements are, the heating elements will actually fracture. The silicon carbide ones, though, they're impervious. But they only go to like 1525, which is OK, because most of our newer zirconias are sintering at 1500 or 1450. Do they have a shorter lifespan also? Well, if you keep doing it fast, yeah. But yeah. 
So we have a, a variety of different uh, sintering furnaces. The, the one that, of course, we can't buy, they sell at the dentist, is the Cerex Speedfire. And this only uses one unit per, per unit, uh, one, one unit per fire, and you can center it around in 10 to 15 minutes. And if you buy the system, you're going to think the unit is beautiful. The, uh, uh, the, the, the most recent uh, furnaces, that, well, I, sh I shouldn't say that. The most recent furnace, when I put this first presentation together a year ago, was the Ostromat furnaces from Dekema. And these are very good. They're silicon carbide furnaces. They're 664 and 6, 674. It's just the size of the unit that matters. They have very rapid heat up and cool down. And it could, you could center single units in, in a, a two-hour cycle. Uh, but in the 664, uh, you could only put three units. And in the 674, you can only put like four units or five units. And again, no, no bridge work. But it works. So the detriment of the silicon carbide is that it, it's limited in temperature. But for the newer zirconias, we don't care about that. And again, only a small number of units can be fired. So you could do it in an emergency, and that's fine. Okay. So OK, I already said that. I'm gonna, OK. So how fast a furnace will cool depends on the design of the furnace. There are furnaces now that have an actual cool cycle, like a little fan inside of it. And that's cool. That's good. It goes a little faster. And just don't bother to do rapid firing on, on large capacity furnaces. Okay. So there's nothing special about the zirconia <clears throat> yet that uh, allows for rapid firing. It's the heating element of the furnace. It's whether or not it has a, a, the size of the furnace, whether or not it has a cooling assist, and the number of units in the furnace. So. There are two critical temperatures for uh, zirconia. On heating, you want to you go through 1,200 degrees very slowly. And slowly, I mean like 7 degrees a minute. And on cooling, 950 is very important. You have to get beyond, you have to cool down to 950 at a slow rate, especially for bridges, and then uh, you could you could speed up the little cooling and don't remove the the uh, units from the furnace until it really gets to like 300 degrees C and always use a, a tray. If you use you always use a lid on the tray. If you use a lid on the tray, that's going to prevent any any drafts from uh, uh, from from impacting the zirconia. And now that we have air conditioners on, it it, it it's a, it's a problem. Okay, so here we see the, the crystallins, nature of zirconia, here's the crystal. And in order to center it, the, all these air particles have to go out. If you do it fast, uh, you may isolate one. And when you do that, what happens is it forms a little, it's just a little hole. It's a little pore that got stuck in there. It's only one micron across. But that reduces the strength of the material, and that substantially impacts the translucency negatively. So you'll see maybe a little opacity. But again, um, uh, some dentists don't mind that as long as they get it done. So, so for crack prevention, to eliminate any internal defects, uh, such as the pores, you want to monitor the sintering time and temperature. And generally, you don't want to fast cool zirconia either way. Even on the glaze cycle, you want to be careful on fast cooling. That's why we, that, that temperature of 950, that's why we, is critical. So we, that's why we don't want the glazes at close to 900. The closer we get to that 900, the worse it's going to be. The more sensitive to thermal shock it's going to be. Okay? Eliminate any surface defects. No grinding after glazing. And any adjustments must be made with high speed and water. It's important. It's imperative that they use water. Eliminate any sharp design features, especially the occlusal faucet. Let that thing round out. And prevent any tensile stresses. Use the proper connector sizes. Okay. These are simple factors, and, and they can save you a lot of trouble. Now, these are my personal recommendations. So you could tell anybody, Paul Cascone said not to do this. You can't say Oregon said not to do this, OK? My personal recommendations, uh, do not make zirconia veneers. And the reason for that is unreliable bonding of the zirconia. I know it's easy to mill it out. I know the porcelain technique, the, the platinum technique is expensive and time consuming. But the, you're 100% better, and you can sleep at night. Uh, this used to be called the Maryland Bridge. I don't know. There's a variety of different things that uh, people call it now. Um, but you know that they use zirconia to make knives. 
Now, why do you think they use zirconia to make knives? Well, number one, it's, the hard, it's harder than anything you're going to be cutting with it. It's harder than bone, especially if you serrate it. It's a very efficient knife, and it's very sharp. You can make it very sharp. What are you making sharp? Well, when you make these little things here, these little wings, these are very sharp. So this is one of these little things that if it goes on your esophagus, you may have a little problem. Okay? So don't make that, because it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail. Eventually, it's going to fail. And the thing that really galls me is post and core. Zirconia post and core, I think, is just personally irresponsible. Um, then the reason is that this application requires some elasticity on the material that's the post. Because eventually, this unit is not going to take a compressive force. It's going to take a side force. It's going to take a shear force. And that's going to maybe crack the zirconia in a very inopportune space that may be irretrievable. Okay. So you don't want to do that. It's, I would recommend not doing that. Okay. Now, we believe that the future is zirconia. We had 100 years of metal. We think we're going to have maybe uh, uh, the same amount of, uh, of uh, zirconia, or, or at least crystalline ceramics. And I added a portion of this slide uh, to explain something to you that maybe some people, other people haven't. And that is, when you specify, remember I told you that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the ISO specification doesn't require for any composition requirements. There's no, there's no requirements. And as a result, some companies have taken advantage of that, and they don't tell you what the composition of the product you're using is on the box, even and sometimes on the MSDS sheet. So responsible companies do give you that information. But you need to know that there are two ways of specifying the yttria content. One is what we're mostly used to in the, on the metal side or on the dental porcelain side, and that's a weight percent. The other, because this is a ceramic, there's something called mole percent. So when you look at the regular high translucent zirconia, these are traditionally the three mole percent materials, and some people abbreviate that as 3Y. On the technical literature, you'll see that as 3Y. And on some packages from like Dent Supply, Avaclar, or Argon, you'll see the yttria content being about 5.5% by weight. So 5.5% by weight is equal to 3 mole percent. The, uh, 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 the interior type products, the super translucent, those are 5 mole percent. And they have almost 10% yttria in it, 9.3% yttria. Now, there are some clinicians out there that don't necessarily understand this as well as they should. And they're providing information to dentists, your clients. And you may hear about this. And the dentist may ask you questions about the composition of the zirconia you're using. Is it 3Y? Is it 5Y? And I got a question where it was mixed. It was, uh, is it 3Y or is it 7%? So you know they, they, they mixed the weight percent with the mole percent. Anytime you get a question from a client that, like that, feel free to just email me, and I'll be happy to answer it. OK? I'll be happy to answer it for you. And if you want me to speak to the client, I'll speak to the client as well. No problem. Okay? We're trying to work with these people that are, that are doing this. We're actually going to see them uh, at the end of the month and see if we could uh, adjust some of this misinformation. OK. So what's been happening? So we, we started with the high translucent material. And that had a strength of 1,100 megapascals and a fairly decent translucency of 40%. And then we, that was 2009 when we saw that introduction. And then we saw the introduction of the anterior type products. These are uh, 5 mole percent, or 9.3 yttria. And, and that had a lower strength, but a higher translucency. So everyone thought that, well, in order to get the higher translucency, you have to sacrifice the strength. Well, we found a way of increasing the strength and increasing the translucency. And that's a new material, HD+. Okay? So it actually addresses some of these issues that these clinicians are talking about, because it's not a high uh, yttria content material. 
and, and it's a higher strength. So you may want to consider that. Uh, uh, this, this processing technique is interesting. You could actually increase the strength of the interior product as well. And uh, there's at least one other company that did the same thing that we did. As I was saying, more types of zirconia will be introduced in the coming years. We think there's going to be something here. Uh, and, uh, and one company has one there, but it's not working as well as they expected. Uh, anyway, so we have to learn how to use it. And we have to learn how to communicate these differences to our doctor. I mean, we used to have a gold alloy, a palladium alloy, a high noble alloy, a noble alloy. They knew that. And, and now the same thing as zirconia. With any material system, it starts out with one, and then it fragments. And that's what we're seeing with the zirconia. We started out with one, and we're getting a fragmentation. So there's going to be more and more. This list is going to get longer and longer. Uh, just, a, uh, just to give you a little hint of uh, how we do some of the testing, this is biaxial flexure. Uh, we make a little disc of the zirconia. Uh, we polish it, and we just put it on a support. See, three balls on the support. And we press down with a certain force, and it cracks. And the strength at which it cracks is the uh, flexural strength of the material. And that's it. So the reported strength of the material can vary, though, depending on the surface preparation, the condition of the test fixture, the grain size of the zirconia. Let me talk about that in a minute. Uh, you see this little, this is a carbide tool. And remember I said the carbide tools aren't as hard as the zirconia. So if you keep pushing the carbide tool into the zirconia, the carbide tool actually fractures and bends over. So if you're not monitoring this, this tip, you could actually ink get high, high strength, but it's really not a high strength. It's a, it's a false strength. Okay? And um, uh, the, the strength is also dependent on the grain size uh, as, as the translucency. And unfortunately, they, they, don't, they, they fight each other. Okay. Now, the translucency is another thing that I want to talk about. The, the number itself is very deceptive because the number comes from a machine. The machine can't determine the, the uh, uh, transmittance of the light and the reflection of the light at the same time. But yet, that's exactly how our eyes work. When you look at the machine, there are two different paths for the light to go through for the transmission and the, and the, uh, and the reflectance. There's two different ways of doing it, and you can't do them at the same time. But our eye, however, can. Marvelous instrument. So it's seeing the light that's coming through as well as the light that gets reflected. So what does that mean? Whenever you compare materials, always use a dye and try and use a, the correct stump shade as well because you're going to have a very big difference with or without the dye, especially on the, on the more translucent zirconia. Okay. Now, um, we had this uh, problem from a laboratory. He called me up and he said, Paul, I'm getting white spots under zirconia. White spots under zirconia, OK. And this is a pretty good laboratory. And, and, and they, they generally have very good procedures. And, and we couldn't figure it out. Uh, we went almost a month, and we couldn't figure it out. And he kept getting these white spots. You can see the white spots here. And then he called me up one Monday, and he said, I solved the problem. I went at the night shift. And what these people were doing, instead of using a tray, they were actually putting the zirconia on the bed of the furnace. Now, this must have, you know, I don't think the state has allowed for marijuana in this, in this particular state. <laughs> but it must have taken them hours to do this work rather than just take the tray out. He had to do each one individually. So he was probably waiting for the whole thing to cool down before he took them off. Okay. So this, this was a very tough problem to solve because, well, this is the reason why. Okay. Uh, it's impossible to make anything foolproof because fools are so ingenious. You, you just never know. Okay. okay. So the key takeaways, zirconia is sensitive to processing. Zirconia cannot be handled like dental porcelain. All contouring and adjustments of sintered zirconia must be done with water. Spending more time in design pays big dividends. The number and type of zirconia products continue to grow. All zirconia types are not the same. That's it. And thank you for your attention. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>